Hello, welcome to the webinar. Um, today is a surprise webinar. I'm sure you're all dying to know what we are going to be revealing today and talking about. So um, I know that uh, I've been excited all week for this webinar and I'm gonna reveal it. I can't keep, I, I just, I gotta go for it here. Our webinar today, we have our special guest, Dr. Ted LeFever. And not only do we have Dr. Ted LeFever, hi Ted. Hi, Dr. Lieber. We also have Nadine Lefebvre. So we have a family affair today. This is going to be so awesome. I am very excited. And also, they have some big announcements to make. So, um, with no further ado, I think we should get. I think we should get into this. What What are we announcing today? And um, also, I am dying to know a little bit about the family business here because um, I'm just realizing we have three generations of Lefebvre and. Um, and doing this fabulous uh, food for our birds. So let's get this started. Um, welcome, and um, who wants to start? Dr. Ted Lefebvre, you want to start with um, a hello introduction? Um, and then I'm going to ask you a couple questions about the family stuff. Okay. Uh, I'll start with, with Laura, who's like, just for everybody out there, she's the most incredible mom ever. So she, she just gets, oh my gosh, she's just wonderful. And, and Nadine's a little pumpkin, but she, she got bigger somehow. So I guess she's a big yeah. pumpkin. You know? And um, so the business started with my father, then I got into it. And for better or worse, my, my daughter is now helping. So we, we, I'm the second generation and Nadine's the third generation. And uh, Nadine's been doing birds since she was very young. In fact, she pretty much grew up with Nutriberries under her toes. Because she uh, yeah. she cared yeah. for, uh, she would earn money by caring for, we had four macaws, three grays, two Amazons, a cockatiel, parakeet, and one robin. And so every morning, yeah. not every morning, every every weekend, she was busy cleaning. So I'm imagining, <laughs> I'm imagining Nadine waking up with a, like a big bowl of Nutriberries for breakfast, you know, instead of Cheerios. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they are, they are human grade, right? So you can technically you can chow down on those if you if you, want, if you wanted to, right? <laughs> <laughs> A little snack. So um, I know when I was growing up that um, my chores involved, you know, maybe you know putting my stuff away or washing the dishes, but it didn't entail um, tending to a flock. So <laughs> Nadine, so <Yeah. laughs> going back to those chores. Um, like, how did you tackle that? That's just amazing. I mean, I, I think I had a dog to walk when I was younger, but you know, it's a couple times around the block and we're good. But, uh, you know, the flock, it's, it's a little bit different sometimes, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, luckily I had uh, my younger sister, so it was the both of us. And that was basically our um, Saturday and Sunday morning where we would go around, change all the water, food, clean the cages. And it was, it was really fun because, you know, they're, even as a little kid, they're so interactive and, um, and we, you know, play games with them while we were cleaning, talking with them and play peekaboo. And one of our birds, Ishtar, she loves to, to do this fun neck movement of mopping the floor. So while we're cleaning the floor, she's going like this with us, like, yeah, go. So super fun <laughs> she's a I bet they're probably uh, early risers so probably yeah. made you a little bit of an early bird maybe <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well, that, that. so i think um gosh that's just so fascinating um i mean to really think about that that's that's a lot of uh a lot of generations of, of bird involvement you know it's pretty impressive um mm -hmm. So um, I think we we got a good we got a good attendance we got a full house here I think um, and just to remind viewers that uh, we are going to give we're going to give away one um, one lucky uh, participant today is going to receive a giveaway we will announce that towards the end of the webinar um, and feel free if you have any questions I'll you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll tackle them the best we can and um, I believe we have okay so now I think we've got a really big announcement today today uh, being October first. What are, what's the, what's the big announcement you want to make? Who wants, who wants to make it? Okay, Nadine, um, you go. And they've got, they've got a presentation. No. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Here we go. The man behind the name. Okay, so, so today we're going to talk about our new gourmet tropical fruit pellets. 
and we're going to go through kind of a history in terms of kind of how we got into the whole pellet thing and how that developed and then we'll move from there and kind of explain the pellets. And should I go ahead and do a share screen? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna see if this works. Okay. You able to see that okay, Laura? Absolutely, yep. Okay, so what we're gonna do, this is, um, oops, we're almost live. Okay, so this is an incredible yellow ape. And we have a yellow ape, Ms. Legol is here. And Ms. Legolas really likes me if I tell her how beautiful her golden eyes are. She's a bit vain that way. So this is just a beautiful picture of a yellow ape, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about per se today, but <laughs> we all love birds here. So if we look at the start of the pet bird nutrition, this poor little budgie here falls into it because this is what came into my father's animal hospital. And no one was seeing birds at the time. This was about 1959. And for my father, when he would see some little guy like this, he just wanted to save him. And in particular, he, lo he loved birds, but he particularly loved parakeets. So he was pretty much a champion for all the parakeets out there. And he really found them to be God's little angels. And here's a blue front. And some blue fronts sometimes are not God's little angels. Sometimes they're just troublemakers. <laughs> and starting back really around, started about 59, 1960, he began to medically start looking at the birds and see how to treat, it, how to treat them. So he would start getting more and more birds. And his animal hospital was in Niles, Illinois, which is in the Chicago area. And so you would get a number of birds coming and they had a, really a wide variety of diseases. And so what he started doing was taking the cutting edge medicine of that time and then applying it to birds, which no one had done before. And what he found is as he would treat them, a lot of them came in with respiratory or breathing infections. Um, he would treat them, they would get better. And then like a year later, six months later, two years later, they would, the infection would, would, would reoccur. And that would happen over and over and over again. And it was the same thing with issues with diarrhea, um, same thing with poor feather condition. He would get things going better, but then it, they would then get worse again. And what he was finding is while he could solve a lot of the medical issues short term, long term, the patients simply just, they just weren't doing well. And as a doctor, that was really frustrating. There's a cute little cockatiel, which I pretty much grew up with um, in high school. We had a, I had three cockatiels that lived in my bedroom and my closest buddy was Pinocchio. And if you have a cockatiel, you know that they love cutting little V shapes in papers. So pretty much all my high school papers had little V shapes all across the top. Um, so, as my father looked at all the different diseases and that they just kept repeating, it didn't make sense. And what he eventually was able to figure out was the problem was nutrition. And if we took a basic diet that a bird was on, which would be like canary seed, millet seed, some sunflower seeds, and some other seeds, there's a, a serious deficiency of vitamin A, D3, and E. The calcium and phosphorus is low, which is necessary for their bones. A lot of their bones would come in and be extremely brittle. Uh, the methionine and lysine are amino acids, and that's necessary to keep the feathers strong. So these are just the major ones. There's a number of other deficiencies, but with having this, it really destroys your health. And so you cannot, even if my dad would get them well, it wasn't going to maintain because um, the body just wasn't healthy enough. This is for you blue and gold lovers. Kind of that, that wild, crazy look. The, um, so what he was practicing doing was adding vitamins and fruits and veggies to the diets to see if he could balance it out that way. So he tried putting vitamins in the water, vitamins on the food, try cutting you know, all types of veggies like in small amounts, try doing different fruits in different amounts. He tried doing almost like cooking some different breads. 
and tried a whole variety of different things to make it work. But what he found was if you're using loose seed, you just couldn't balance it out. It just would not work. And there are some exceptions where there's some birds who do amazing on just a loose seed and um, some veggies and fruits tossed in, but it's real a minority. For most of them and his patients in particular, it just didn't work well enough. So my father was like, there had to be a better answer. And so what happened was he looked around and he saw that pellets were used for other animals. And so he's like, well, hey, let's try pellets for pet birds. No one had tried that at the time. In fact, no one had considered it at the time. In fact, basically, um, when he had the pellets going, people thought he was a bit crazy because everybody knew that you fed seeds to birds. And the whole idea was like, well, a bird's not a rabbit. You can't give it pellets. But he moved forward on it anyway. This is the Niles Animal Hospital where I basically worked every weekend, every Christmas, every New Year's, every 4th of July and any holiday because he couldn't ask his staff to come in. So it was pretty much up to me and uh, my brothers and sisters. And I was the, the older one. And so I was there pretty much every holiday. And so we brought a pellet machine here. And if you look to the far right, there's a door near that black car there. And so when the, the small little lab pellet machine come in, we literally had to take the frame off the door because we couldn't get it through the door. And the, the whole pellet which, machine, which came from California Pellet Mill, just fit through the door. He had like a half inch to quarter inch. Otherwise, we're going to have to start removing bricks. But we got it in. And in the back of the Niles Animal Hospital is where the first pet bird pellets were made. And this is a, one of the first packages that were made. This is actually a box. And what we did is we filled the pellets into a bag. There was two pounds in a bag with a little um, twisty tie. And then what you had to do was you'd seal the box with a hot glue gun. And the trick was to get the glue on there without burning your fingers with the hot glue, which took a little bit, but we eventually got the hang of it. And um, when we put it out there, people really thought this was just nuts. And, um, oh, this is some more packaging. Um, eventually went from the boxes into these little tubs here. And over time, as people tried it, we got birds onto the pellets and people said, hey, this is a possibility. People started to see their birds live longer. And what happened was they stopped getting so sick because it was such a common problem back in the 70s and then in the 60s and 70s. And then the chronic diseases started to disappear and the feather quality began to significantly improve. And as you've seen today, old age became possible. Back then, birds just died early on. My little Pinocchio um, lived to age 27 on a diet of pellets and nutriberries. Um, but before that, cockatiels would commonly, you know, live six to eight years and pass away. And now we're getting birds where we literally have had to make senior bird nutriberries because they're getting so old. So the Focusing on a balanced diet for birds really made all the difference. And this is an example of the pellets that we have right now. And this is the most current version. Um, and they've slowly, we kind of try to improve them every year just a bit. And these have no artificial colors, flavors, or preservative. We use as many non-GMO ingredients to the point now we're at 99% non-GMO. Um, we use human grade ingredients, the omega-3 and 6 balance, and veterinary formulated recommended. A lot of our formulation is actually done with UC Davis nutritionists there um, to get, me give us the most cutting edge nutrition that there is. So that's kind of the history of all our pellets, kind of how we got um, started with them and how we got to where we are today. And now we have a new pellet to bring forth and I'm going to hand that off to my daughter Nadine as soon as I can figure out how to stop the share here. Okay Nadine can you share? 
Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now today we have launched our new uh, gourmet palettes, tropical fruits. And these are based off my grandfather's original recipe that my dad just talked about. Oh, Nadine, do you want to move this into presentation mode? Ah, yes. Thank you. There we go. Is that, you can see? Looks good. So these um, will be available starting October 12th. And uh, what's special about them is they are the only fruit pellet made exclusively with the natural sweetness of fruits. There is no added sugar or fructose. We don't have any artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives. And there are uh, pieces of mango, papaya, and pineapple. And like the original recipe, it's over 99% non-GMO ingredients. And this package is the parrot food variety. And we posted this video today on our social media. Um, it's just a quick clip introducing the pellets. And Nadine, that's on the um, the YouTube channel as well. Is that? Yes. Oh, uh, looks like we don't have audio. Yeah, I don't think it's playing the music, but uh. could you sing along? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the video is on uh, on YouTube, on our Instagram, and on our Facebook, and the music is pretty fun. So too bad that it's not playing. <laughs> but it just highlights some of the um, uh, great aspects about it, as I mentioned and um, mentioning my grandfather and the uh, different varieties that we have available. So I'm going to go through those as well. Um, so we have it for passerines, the French and Canary versions. There we go. And for citizens, we have the parakeet, cockatiel, conure, parrot, and macaw, and cockatoo. There we go. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the main benefits is that uh, there's no added sugar or fructose. It's the only fruit pellet made exclusively with uh, mango, papaya, and pineapple. And uh, we have, um, those fruits are the third ingredient. So they're very yummy. We, um, the birds who have tried it are, um, they really like it. They, we have some videos um, that show some birds really enjoying it. It's really cute. The owners uh, remarked that they liked it a lot more than some other pellets that they've tried with them. And, um, and we carefully mix it in small batches so that we can maintain the delicate fruit taste. So that way we don't need to add um, sugar or fructose. It's already really good just as it is. There's no fruit flavoring, there's no fruit powder, just the real pieces of fruit themselves. And the fruit is 100% sulfite free. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's nothing artificial, the non-GMO ingredients and human grade as well. And continuing with our tradition of um, bird health being our priority, it's veterinary formulated and recommended, nutritionally balanced with the latest scientific research, and omega-3 and 6 balance uh, for the healthy skin, feathers, and immune system. So another fun photo. So this is the um, ingredients and the guaranteed analysis 
of the um, Parrot and Conure version. Just to highlight that the dried fruit is the third ingredient. We have um, diff three different sizes. The smallest is uh, about a one pound size. And that's the first package shown on the left. In the middle is the four pound bag. And then we have a 25 pound uh, box. And each variety has all three sizes. And the finch is a little smaller, um, but about the same weight. And uh, we just <laughs> wanted to include uh, the tiger parakeet photo, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> if only they could um, So Nadine, I'm sorry. We have a we have a question. Uh, someone want to know um, specifically, like which of these um, would be for an Amazon? Which size? How would you size an Amazon with this um, line here? Would it be the yeah, uh, we parrot? One. Yeah, we would recommend the, the parrot size for the Amazons, yeah. Wow, and, and talking about the ingredients, um, just when you look at an ingredients list, they, they usually, whatever you've got the most of is at the top of the list. So, so when you're saying it's the third ingredient, it means that it's not like a little tiny flake in the, bo you know, in the bottom of the mix. It's, it's, it's got a lot of real fruit and stuff, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we um, we're like we're gonna put the we want to put the fruit in there, and we want it to be a a, um, a, a big part of the pellet. So um, and to have high quality fruit as well. Not you know as I mentioned, not putting just like a fruit powder, fruit flavoring. We wanted to have um, actual high quality fruit for them to enjoy while eating their food. That is exciting. Um, boy, I, I wish I would, I, I'm sure a lot of, um, some, a lot of birds out there wish they were on the test bird side <laughs> to try out yeah. the new <laughs> Like an exclusive fun list to be on, I'm sure. Um, so, no, that's exciting. Uh, oh, we're excited. Wow, so. and how, how long, just curious, like from, how long, what, what, what behind the scenes on this, um, like how long has this been in the world like from start to you know from the concept to the you know rolling it out is it, it i know it's a lot of hard work on on everyone's part here um so this is probably something that you know you've been working on you know behind the scenes for for a long time now right yeah we probably started yeah. on, we probably started on the idea of it about 10 years ago Wow. Okay, that is a long time to be playing. so well, a lot the, of thought went into this right? well the pro the, the difficulty was it's extremely difficult to make a fruit pellet that actually tastes like fruit. So the, so we would try and we would fail and we try and we fail and we try and, and there is nothing, there is nothing that matched the level of quality that we wanted. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is Freya, by the way. She wanted to say hi. So she like, she's, she's just kind of hanging. Um, so there's nothing nothing that really matched that, that would hit it from a quality aspect. And so the project kind of waited for a bit. And, and then Nadine's the one who, who really brought it forward again. So let's look at it again. And then our team looked at it and we, we actually discovered a way to make it possible. It required some innovation, some new ways of modifying equipment, but it worked. So when you say that um, trying to, to nail the, the fruit flavor, um, did that, was there a test? <laughs> person <laughs> like anyway how did you how did you had to nail down the fruit flavor like what was the, like did you have your you know people help you like hey you got to try this tell me if you taste the fruit yeah we, we would feed nadine it would pretty much <laughs> yeah. no, there, there, a there, blind there, test right <laughs> now there, there would be well one thing you, you could taste it but what we did is there's different veterinarians we work with across the country and we would send them samples to try either on their own birds yeah. or if they had some customers who wanted to try some new pellets. But the veterinarians tend to be really sensitive to how the birds do, how they like it, and if, there's, if they see any clinical issues. So yeah, so we get a chance to test it. And, and just you know, throw that out there, speaking of veterinarians, um, Dr. Faber, you went to the same veterinary school as your father, correct? I don't know if people yeah. realize that, that you have a lot of um, veterinary background in, in, your, in your name. 
So. Yeah, we both went to Iowa State, so it was it's a good school. Very good. Um, let's see. I, I think uh, we might have had a question or two here. If you guys want to answer some. Um, by the way, someone did comment that uh, that your cute little dog there might be the fourth generation of the fever. So. <laughs> yeah, we call her. <laughs> yeah, she's our doctor. <laughs> yeah. Those. Um, so. Okay, so with the new, someone, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey had a question about the, um, the version of the new pellets that they would use for their blue-headed pionis. Um, would it be the one for a parrot, or can they, you know, can they, can, can a bird try, like, you know, some birds, they like, diff it, it's all about texture, too, so um, right, could, right. A, could a big bird try a smaller size pellet if maybe they find that more appetizing or appealing? Like, could you give your macaw a you know parrot size one or give your um budgie a, a cockatiel size one like do they can they transfer with the sizes yeah so it's always amazing to me how a macaw will just take like a little millet seed and just get it right in his beak and hold on to it so you could give a macaw like a canary pellet it just won't be balanced for that particular species but it's close enough that it'll be fine if you want to give it to him for a while. And the same thing, the, the diet of the parakeet and the cockatiel would be very similar. So interchange between those two isn't an issue because they're both granivores really from Australia. Um, so those will be um, extremely similar. Um, so you can go between them, like you could, you could take a macaw pellet and give it to a parakeet just to chew on, because I think they'd enjoy finding, you know, eating the different edges and such. But I would make it 100% of their diet. But I think okay. as a for okay. foraging food, I think it'd be fabulous. And so for the the pionis, um, that would probably fall in under the parrot size. Right. Exactly. Um, yep. Um, okay, and then so Anne asked a good question, uh, just to clarify. So. Are these meant to uh, supplement a pellet diet or can these be the main part of a pellet diet? Yeah, no, no, the, these are designed as 100% balanced. So, so they, they, they can be fed all the time. And um, the cockatiel and parakeet are actually designed to um, support light breeding because I'm, we're always concerned that an inexperienced bird person may end up having parakeets or cockatiel breeds even if they didn't mean it. Ah, good point. Yeah, so it, it, it's designed as a full diet. Okay. And it's a yummy, they're, they're really yummy. So our responses that we're getting <laughs> in from people is like, oh my gosh, these things are so delicious. And so the veterinarians we work with have been like, would you please get these out because they can convert more birds faster onto them. Nice, nice. Um, and just from, from my experience with, with feeding my birds pellets, um, I know that the the debris, you know, the, the, the shoots out of the cage, it's a lot less. <laughs> it's a lot more manageable to, to clean up and stuff. But I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, and then also, so uh, we have uh, Tamea asks, um, is it dehydrated fruit? You wanna talk a little bit about the, the fruit that's involved? I know it's the third ingredient, so. Um, yeah, it is a dehydrated fruit. When, when, you, when you make the pellet, you have to be wary of moisture because if you had too much moisture in the food, it could go bad sitting on the shelf. Okay. And um, so it is a dehydrated fruit. And it's, it's, a, it's the same fruit that you would get in the store. And it's, an, it's a really high quality human grade fruit. It's yummy. I have people at work who eat it. Oh yeah, I'm sure they snack. Not, not, not the ones that go with the food, but they take samples and bring it into the break room. It's just like getting the dried fruit in, you know, in your little grocery aisle, a little scoop of dried fruit. Exactly. That, exactly. Okay, um, and so Jade asks, is this gonna be available in Canada? I hope so. So if you <laughs> ask the pet stores and people to get it. So um, with the results, we, with the interest that we've had, I would think it would get there. I just don't know how quick. So October is a little bit of a hard month. Um, so it's not per se the ideal time to launch it for some distributors. So they may not get it in and it might be January by the time they get it. Okay. Because everybody's everybody's stocking their shelves right now up for Christmas. So it's going to be a little bit hard for some pet stores to get it in right now. 
All right, but they can start asking their pet store that they absolutely they say, hey, there's this thing you want to start shopping list, right? <laughs> okay, uh, so then Karen asks, um, what is the shelf life? So, so bird food, just like human food, it uh, if you turn over the the bag, there's a spot on there that says, is it a use by, a sell by, the date that's on the back the package? Yeah, so we'll have a best before date. Um, and what's nice is because we make everything at our company, um, literally when we make it from the pellet mill, it goes right to being packaged. And then when we package it, these all get packaged with nitrogen. So what it does, it allows it to have an 18 month shelf life. And that's like sitting on a shelf. That's not like refrigerated or any, um, it's like in a normal. Yeah. In, in a, in a normal 70, 80 degree weather. Um, oh, uh, someone asked, Judy wants to, she wants to know, will the original recipe still be available? The classic, the classic recipe for, um, I'm sorry, not there's, there's classic Nutriberry, but the, uh, the, the, I think, I think these are going to become, classic. right, I think these will become classic. <laughs> so, yeah, so these will become available in about two months. We will drop the small size of the parrot and the macaw, because we don't, most people have macaws um, and parrots by the, by the um, five pound size or 25 pound size. So we'll drop the small size, but the classic will be maintained. Okay. Um, let's see what other questions we have. Ah, uh, uh, this one has, uh, okay. So Monica had, so her 20 year old cockatiel, that's awesome, 20 year old cockatiel. Is yeah, right. fabulous. Yay, Monica. <laughs> Doing a good job, Monica. Um, my 20 year old cockatiel has only eaten the fever his entire life and is on senior Nutriberries. He picks out only the seed he likes and doesn't eat the pellet part um, unless I hand feed each pellet individually to him. He's spoiled that way. Um, how can I get him to eat the pellets? So he, he likes the senior Nutriberry. And I, I totally get you, Monica, because my bird was the same way. I had to, uh, with the pellets, um, he loved it when I hand fed them from my hand, <laughs> just like he would eat them just when I, you know, slowly. And as I stand there and are you almost done yet? He would eat them. No, no problem. Um, so I, he was a little spoiled that way instead of like, you know, leaving them in the bowl and he would go and do it himself. It's just kind of like, so um, I guess do you guys have any tips or tricks on, on how, how to get them to, uh, to not have it, to feed them individually out of a picky, say bird, a picky eater. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that Monica has been really well trained by her bird. Yes. And, and I'm sure the bird absolutely loves being fed one pellet at a time. And so it, it just sounds like a spoiled little boo-boo, which is just wonderful. Um, if you want to get him, I mean, part of it is my hunch is the little cockatiel just loves interacting with mom that way. And it's kind of become a game. If you had to push it a bit more, what you can do is you can just feed less and you put it in a bowl and it's kind of like a kid. It's like, okay, I'm not giving you more food until you eat what you have because you know that they'll eat it, but they, they sometimes like to play with their food and whatever, but you can actually restrict. You don't give them more senior bird Nutriberries until your, your little bird eats what's there. That would probably be the easiest way. It's a little bit of tough love because the bird really wants you to feed each pellet by hand because it's, it's mom. So someone asked, uh, this is kind of going into that, Je Jeffrey wanted to know if, um, if a transition is recommended. So would you recommend giving a little bit of new food uh, with a little less of the old food for like a week or so? Kind of like to transition? Yeah, it's pretty much with most animals. If, if, you're, if it was on, let's say it was on XYZ pellets and, and switching to um, these new pellets, it helps to transition over time. It can be a week, it could be three weeks. And it's kind of watching what the bird's eating. And with birds in particular, if you watch their droppings, you'll know how much they're eating. If it's going from one pellet to another, that's usually an easier transition. If they've been eating loose seed, that's gonna, you might wanna take a month. If they've been eating loose seed for five years and you're gonna get them onto our pellets, then you might wanna mix in like, start with 25% our pellets, with 75% seed, then the next week go 50-50, then 75% are pellets, 25% seed, till you get to 100%. So a little bit tends on the conversion. And from a watching aspect, if you count the number of droppings a day, 
then you'll know that they're still eating. Okay. Um, that kind of, uh, so then Claire had a question. Uh, how much sugar does the fruit add? Uh, will the sugar content cause issues if the diet is you know, as fed exclusively with the dried fruit? Um, the exact sugar content is pretty low. So it's, it's not going to cause, it's not going to cause any issues in terms for the birds because it's birds, sugar is okay for birds because they run such a high metabolism. Okay. I mean, they literally, their body tempered, I mean, birds generally don't get a fever. They just die because their, um, their temperature runs like 104 to 107 degrees. So they tend to go through a lot of nutrients. So if you have a small amount of sugar and it's not going to give a problem, whether it's our pellets or somebody else's pellets, um, it's just for fruit pellets. Um, you, sh you really don't, you should have to add sugar for taste. Ideally, the fruit provides enough taste and enough sweetness that it's enough. So you can feed 100% of our pellets and it'll just be fine. Okay, that kind of goes into a question from Gloria. She wanted to know uh, any chance the Nutriberries will be launching with um, no sugar slash additional sweetener? Um, yeah, so the, um, there really isn't sugar in the, in the Nutriberries. What there is is there's some corn syrup. And the corn syrup is actually, it isn't actually sweet at all. It's what's considered a low dextrose corn syrup and it's actually structural. So it's really not there for any flavor. What it does is it helps hold it together because what we're trying to do is to get more foraging. So the advantage that Nutriberries have over pellets is that the birds spend twice as much time eating them. The disadvantage is they cost more because they're harder to make. And each diet has its own pros and cons. Okay. Uh, and someone wanted to know, uh, Karen wanted to know, uh, just curious to know, would freezing degrade the nutrition? Can you freeze? Can you freeze them? You can. And so with the nutritionist we work with, he'll often freeze diets so that it can be used longer. But I don't know how much people will ask me, how long can we extend by freezing? And that would be a long scientific study, and I don't know. Okay. So yes, in theory you can. How much longer you get, I don't know. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see what else we got here. We got some good questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're making my brain think. Like, oh right. my gosh. <laughs> here, here's one. You got to go back in time. So we need a time machine, okay? Um, so Monica Wait, asked, how much is it, did that... Is it an easier question? Well, let's see. Monica wanted to know how much did that pellet machine cost you guys? The one you had to haul in that barely fit to the door. Was that, oh. was that a big investment? <laughs> I think it was a big investment, but I was, I think, 12 years old at the time. And so I'm not really sure what it costs. I just remember taking the door apart and I didn't know you could do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you have yeah. to help it in, like on a dolly? Were you like. No, there was like, there was like four people bringing it in and carpenters tearing the door apart. And, and they had to rip out some dog, dog runs to get it all put in, which to me was all exciting, but I have no idea what it cost. I just, I know the amount of pellets it would produce might have been like, uh, I'm thinking maybe 50 pounds an hour. Wow. So it, it, was, it was literally what we used as production is what um, a lab would use. And this was actually a lab pellet mill. So was it loud? Was it like a loud machine? I'm no, 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 it's just a tiny, it's a tiny little, the, it had a big base but the main part that spun and made the pellets was relatively small. And I, so that's part of what I would do on Saturdays and Sundays is, um, I would make, yeah. So I, I basically grew up making pellets, you know, started at about around age 12. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, so, uh, to me, I wanted to ask, can I mix the flavor pellets and non flavored pellets together? Can you like, give them a little bit of a, a trail mix kind of, so to speak? Of Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can take some regular pellets, take some classic pellets, take some fruit pellets, and then mix some tropical fruit and add some sunny orchard and mix it all together and do all types of flavor matching. Okay. Okay. And let's see what else we have. Kind of like Pringles potato chips. That's right. Try to guess the flavor. <laughs> like that, right? Um, um, Okay, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm going through these things here. Uh, someone want to know, this is going back to Canada. Um, Eva wanted to know, can it be ordered and shipped to Canada? I'm sure that it can. Um, yeah. 
and sometimes it, it's just a little bit of paperwork getting across the border that can become an issue. But yes, yes, we can ship to Canada. Okay. Um, and then uh, Annette wanted to know, uh, will there be a Nutriberry formula using these pellets? No, because these pellets are essentially when you make pellets, and this is with anyone's pellets, is you take a whole bunch of seeds and you grind them all up to make things balanced. Well, in Nutriberry, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying not to grind the seeds up or at least for most of them. So when we add pellets into it, which has a, some ground seeds into it, they have to complement the, um, the um, seeds that are in that diet. So it, it, there, um, there wouldn't be a way to make it like the same type of pellet. And I'm not sure if that's quite answering the, the question, but the pellets that go in Nutriberries have to be significantly different than a completely balanced Okay, okay. Um, let's see, I've got a question. Uh, uh, Lisa wanted to know if, uh, if maybe perchance um, there'll be some samples to the stores. Uh, any kind of, uh, like, I, like ha right now, if you wanted to go out and, um, and get these, like, can you go to a store and find them right now or? Is this something to order on the on the on on site. This is Susie. Hi, Susie. Oh, that's a different dog. <laughs> yeah, this this is this is this is our linebacker Maltese. <laughs> oh, we're doing dog time. <laughs> yeah, she's a she, she's a sweet. Well, she was kind of like, Dad, would you pick me up? Would you pick? I'm like, okay, okay, you've been good. Oh, and there's Lola. <laughs> nice. um, so so nobody has these these pellets right now. They um they launch October twelfth. Okay, that's right. You said, okay, October twelfth, which is fast approaching because today is already the first of October. Believe it or yeah. not. I think the next question needs to go, go to Nadine. She's been there very quiet. Okay, Nadine. Um, let's see here. Um, <laughs> let me find a really difficult one. <laughs> um, let's, I okay. Lorraine says that I order pe her pepper lifetime uh, course from. I'm not sure if I'm going to say this correctly. I order pepper lifetime course for my grays and adult lifetime small for my kikes. Will these still be available in the future? So I'm thinking. Lifetime, I think that's a different pellet company. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I think that's Harrison's. But, yeah, but I wouldn't order from them. I'd, I'd get from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um. <laughs> um, um you know what? Okay, I have to bring, yeah. I, I want to kind of give, uh, if you don't mind, the audience um, just a little bit of um, of a backstory that I remember now that you both have your dogs there. So you actually changed a formula because you were afraid that parrots, when they dropped it on the ground and the dog might pick it up and eat it, might get sick. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, like uh, from raisins to dates. Uh -huh. Does that ring a bell? Well, it, it, the problem is, is that our, our birds are just so darn smart. Yes. And there's so many birds out there that would whistle the dog over. Okay. And then they'd either feed the dog, but we actually had one kind of malicious little Amazon that wanted to, it would literally bonk the dog in the head with Nutriberries. Okay. <laughs> and so it just... So the, the birds are just, they're constantly manipulating the dogs with food, the Nutriberries, and then we realized the Nutriberries, they had raisins on it. And while it's a very small percentage, there's some dogs that can get a, um, basically a kidney toxicity due to that. So we realized, we hadn't really thought about it, like, oh my gosh, we had concerned about the dogs. And so yes, we, we, we decided it was wisest to replace the raisins with dates. I mean, I just thought, when I heard that, I thought that was amazing because you're literally looking out for the other pets, not just the birds in the house, but. That's, and, because, uh, that's because the birds are so much fun and so much trouble. Yes, and I'm gonna <laughs> guess, can I take a guess, was that a cockatoo, an Amazon, or a macaw? <laughs> throwing stuff because I, those. They all, they all do it. Yeah. You know, the, the Amazons, they're all troublemakers. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And the dogs are always like the, you know, the, the gullible, like, oh my gosh, they're gonna yeah. drop something good here. I gotta, I gotta wait. <laughs> 
whether it's good or not for them. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's see if we have any more questions. This is, I, I am enjoying this thoroughly. I'm just kind of getting the- Oh, Laura, you're fabulous. This is fun. Thank you. Um, okay. So I, I think we, we have established, some, uh, Anne had asked, um, you know, these are meant as a, as a main, they can be part of, they can be the main diet, not, not a, just a supplement to the diet. Um, correct? Correct. Okay. And mm -hmm. let me see here. Okay. See what else pops up. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. So Monica wanted to ask you, did Dr. Ted Lefebvre ever travel or call Australia or other countries to inquire or vets um, there about how they treated bird problems and find they were also find, uh, trying to find a way to better their lives without success. So going back, I guess, to the, you know, um, trying to better, you know, birds' lives to their health, um, was there any involvement with Australia? Travel or, or consult with vets in Australia or any you got, you guys collaborate with vets all over the world, right? Right. I mean, if we're talking back when my father was doing things initially, he was about 20 years ahead of the game. So, or maybe 20, 25 years, really ahead of any other veterinarians do that. I, did, I do know he collaborated with anybody anywhere that was possible. But it was really back in the 1960s, um, it was very unusual. So finding anyone who knew much about pet birds back then was more, was more difficult. Um, but as the, I think the AAV, Association of Avian Veterinarians, uh, got together in about 1983. It's approximately then. So about in the late 70s, many, many more bird vets, people showed, had a lot more interest in birds. And my father used to go around lecturing to all types of universities, just trying to get more people to be veterinarians. And it was interesting because when I'd be at trade shows, after my father passed away in um, 2001, I'd have veterinarians come up to me and they never came up to me like, oh, thank God your dad made pelleted bird food, okay? What they would tell him, it's like, your father was so inspiring. He literally changed my veterinary career because when he lectured on birds and how much he loved them, I decided I would love to do birds too. And that's probably one of the biggest impacts he had was he encouraged a whole generation of veterinarians that becoming a, a bird vet is just an amazing career. Wow. And with that said, um, you want to just a little bit about the, the award that, that, you, that you give out every year to an a avian veterinarian, the, the meaning behind the, the, the hands and the budgie and the, the TJ Lefebvre uh, Vet of the Year Award that uh, I don't know if people know that this is behind the, you know, keeping it in the, the bird community with the veterinarians um, inspired to, to do what they can to fill those hands. So what, what exactly, the, the, the sculpt, how did the sculpture come across it? Because that's what's presented, right? Right, 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 right. So, so that was, surprised, like, you, you know about that too. So, so the, um, that's kind you of in the veterinary the com And you can read this. Yeah. Too. I, 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 well, I encourage everyone to, to go and, and learn the, the, uh, okay. the, the history of the buttons. It's really so, fascinating. Yeah, so after my dad died, we wanted to do something to honor him because he really inspired so many people to be veterinarians. And my dad, as I kind of mentioned early, is like, he wanted to save every single parakeet out there. So what we did is we found an artist, um, a bronze artist, we gave him a picture of my dad's hands and we had a little budgie, you know, it was a little baby little budgie in hands because it represented my father so well. So every year, Actually, except this year, because it's coronavirus year, um, every year mm -hmm. veterinarians nominate other exotic veterinar avian veterinarians that are exceptional. And then at a university, they go through and review who they think the best veterinarians are. And then that committee picks the most outstanding um, clinical veterinarian. And then they get the Dr. TJ Lefebvre Award in honor of my father and in honor of them being an amazing practitioner. Wow. So maybe that's something when you, when you, when you go to your bird's uh, vet next time, see if, see if they've had this prestigious award in their office, then you know you got a good one. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there's lots of good veterinarians out I mean, there. Yes, and, there, and, not, and, okay, and, there are lots of, lots of good vets out there. <laughs> yeah, and a few of them have won the award, but it, it, it's, it's, um, it's pretty hard. It's a pretty hard, the committee's pretty tough on who they select. Well, that, now they can ask them about that. Hey, so you have yep. the, you got the hands on the budget there. Um, okay, so then I have, a, let's see, a couple more questions. Um, okay, are all the um, ingredients the, for the U.S. and Canada sourced, are they organic? So are they um, U.S. slash Canada sourced ingredients and are they organic? That was from Jeffrey. He wanted to. Okay. Help. So the, um, we, do sh we do make everything be non-GMO. And it's 99% because there's some small percentage of vitamins that um, I haven't been able to get to be non-GMO. It's like some really tiny minuscule thing by definition. Um, but it is, so 99% is non-GMO, but it is not organic. As much of it is sourced U.S. and Canada as possible. The fruit, however, papaya and mango, it's going to come from, um, it's, I believe most of it's from South America. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Lisa wanted to know, um, so she uses your uh, the senior pellet berries for her 40 and 30-year-old grays. <laughs> oh, well done. And her younger grays as well. Um, are you considering making a senior pellet, not not berry, uh, maybe with this flavor or a mix in it? So you've got we got this, this, the the fever senior pellet berries. Will there be a do you see a senior tropical pellet mix down the down the future uh, uh, down the line? It'll probably depend on how how hard Nadine pushes for it. All right, Nadine, it's on you now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so possibly well people are. Uh, we'll make another uh, and we'll have another chat like this next time when when that there we go something else to look forward to here um all right so uh let's see um okay here's a here's a more serious question daniel i wanted to know are we are you thinking of eliminating peanuts from the these pellets in the future given the possible connection to aspergillosis aspergillus molds you know the peanuts and aspergillus is that yeah, 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 yeah. So, so aspergillosis, uh, uh, aspergilla has a chance of being in a number of foods. So what we do is we test for them. And so um, the peanuts that we do have our food, not only are they human grade, but they're particularly tested for any toxins. Um, so they're really good quality peanuts. But even if the human, there's sometimes if the human grades, if they don't look or smell right to us, we don't accept it. So the peanuts we do have, they're fabulous peanuts. And peanuts is a good, I like peanuts because they're a good source of protein and fat. Um, that's healthy for the bird. If you balance it appropriately with the rest of the food, you can get the energy level to be right. And birds really enjoy peanuts, kind of like they enjoy fruit. So if it's monitored carefully, and we, again, we, we, do everything in house so we can control it. I'm very confident that the peanuts we have are good, but like um, these pellets don't have any peanuts in them. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, um, oh, so should should these pellets be supplemented with fresh vegetables? Yeah. I mean, you can add fre fresh veggies to these pellets and it's just fine. And I'll, I'll just, as for those people who have parakeets and cockatiels out there, they're, this is a little bit technical, but they're granivores. So I don't care whose palate you have them on. Um, you want about 20% of the diet to be a seed. Okay, whether it's our nutriberries or even some loose seeds tossed in the palate because they're, they're, they grow up in a very arid environment and their intestinal tract is better if it has some whole seeds in it. And what the intest, like if this was a seed, uh, how do I do this here? Um, if that's a seed, the intestine tract kind of clamps around the seed and then it pushes the seed. It can actually push it backwards up the intestinal tract. And what it does is it helps with the, any additional water get absorbed in the intestinal tract. So they get much better droppings. So for your granivores being your parakeets and cockatiels, whoever pellet diet they're on, um, put them on some nutriberries, just at least 20% of the diet or put them on some other regular seed. They'll just long-term, they'll do better. And you're saying granivores, like they forage on the ground? I mean, I'm sorry, granivores, grains. Granivores, I'm sorry. I. No, you're fine, you're fine. I'm mumbling. No, granivores, that's a, a, that's a tricky word, granivores. So there we go, now I know. Okay. Granivores, I'm gonna memorize that next time. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, we did have a question about, uh, for Nancy, she wants to know what is the protein and fat percentage, percentages? I'll give that one to Nadine because I don't remember off the top of my head. All right, Nadine, pop question for you. Um, mm -hmm. What is the protein and fat percentage? Let me look. And let's see if I have kind of, uh, oh, and we do have, I do want to give a heads up that we do have our, um, our winner to announce for today's giveaway. So stay tuned, it'll happen shortly. Oh yeah, so someone had mentioned that, um, Adrian mentioned that um, her, her flock, they love the nutriberries and interestingly um, enough, the bigger birds love the smaller sized ones. It's just so, it's, it's kind of funny how the bigger bird is like, they like the little finesse things. Like when you, when you mentioned like the macaws liking the tiny, tiny, like even like millet size millet. -like. Exactly. No, they're incredible with their beaks. Yeah. Um, so the question was fat and protein? Yes, fat and protein percentage. The protein is for minimum 14 and the fat is minimum 5.2%. Uh, for what, oh Nadine, for which one? That's for the paired and conure. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, wow. Well, <laughs> those are some really good questions. Um, oh, fabulous questions. Oh my gosh, this is like the smartest audience. Definitely. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Someone, now this is a good, thank you, Timmy, for asking this, because I get to say this word again, and I'm going to conquer this word. Are finches granivores? The word you said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> they said um, granivores. Un unfortunately, I'm not the biologist, but my, I will say no. They're going to, we, we would, I just, I consider them as, boy, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble on this one, but I would say they're passerines. And um, so I would not put them into the granivore club. So, okay. so the, the finches and canaries do wonderful on a pelleted diet. And, ex, and, and, canary, and um, both those animals really do well. A lot of times when you'd have a canary on a seed diet, it'd be this fabulous singer and it would just stop. And what happened is it would get into a molt and it wouldn't have enough energy to finish the molt. Then it would do a little bit better and it would bolt some feathers and it just, and then it would eventually get immunosuppress itself and get sick. And when you put them on a pelleted diet, what would happen after about six months, they go through a full molt, get all the good feathers back in because they have the nutrition and then they would start singing again. So, and finches, oh my gosh, the, those cute little zebra finches, you know, little guys, meep, yeah. meep, meep. They would commonly die after two, three years when they were just on a seed diet. You put them on a pelleted diet, they'll live for 12 years, 10, 12 years. And they really do well. So both the um, finches and canaries will do extremely well on pelleted diets. Wow, I know that's a, um, probably the, the one species that uh, people don't realize that, that pellets, they have one, that there's pellets available in their sizes for them specifically, and two, that it's good for them, so. Yeah, once they, get, you're exactly right. It's hard to get to that audience to know that. But once they get them on it, those little guys, they, they do fabulous. That's great. Um, okay, so I think we're just about out of our time. I got to make the announcement on, on who wins our giveaway today. Yes. And, ready? So let's do a drum roll. It is Monica Eberhardt. You are our winner today, which is, I think, the first time we've given away something on one of these webinars. So this is like a big moment. So congratulations. Yay, Monica. Yay. Hey, thank you for joining us. Everyone else joined us today, but that's, yeah, so that's our big winner right there. Um, and uh, so so we can find, and anyone who's joining us, they can find um, the information on the lefebvre.com website, right? The, mm -hmm. About the tropical pellets. And yeah. um, so that's going to be, uh, I think that's like on the front of the Shop Now page too, so it should be pretty easy to find. Um, and mm -hmm. then, uh, so guys, everyone should check that out because it's a new uh, new flavor. Uh, see how your birds and and give feedback right we want to hear you know how their birds like it um, and then um, so I just wanted to also give us a, a, a heads up for what we've got uh, next week um, I believe we're gonna be seeing you again dr. Ted you right um, uh, I, next week I'm more like an assistant 
Uh -huh. I'll, I'll, okay. just be hold, I'll just be holding the dogs. And then my, so my and then my wife Chris will be um, talking or explaining about communication, loving communication with birds. Now this is one you obviously you do not want to miss because we're gonna have I, I don't know if you, Chris Christine Davis she was um, I have to say when um, when I was on Bird Talk magazine um, her heart to heart column was by far and away one of our uh, most popular columns and. Um, and so I am so excited to have to have Chris online with us and answering, you know, giving us some advice on um, on the official title for the webinar is going to be um, it's not all talk six steps to loving communication with your bird and other animals. So, um, so that is that's something you don't want to miss. And that's going to be October 9th, um, same time, uh, same channel. <laughs> so um, <laughs> And and yes, I, and 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 Dr. Lippy will be uh, be, her, be her assistant, I guess you could say. Um, so this is going to be something you don't want to miss. Um, and I, I think we're all done. I think we ran out of time today. That went by one very quick. Thing. I one more thing. We're going to be sending everyone a twenty five percent off coupon for the new um, tropical fruit pellet. So that will be sent uh, via email. Oh, excellent! Didn't yeah. I didn't even know that. Um, that's very cool. All right. Another surprise. <laughs> so, like, I'm surprised. The host is surprised. Oh, this is awesome. Any more surprises? <laughs> Those are the good type of surprises you want to hear. So, wow. So they could just they could check their their inbox for a coupon and then uh, our discount code. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nadine. Um, I think well, I think that's going to have to be all for today. And then uh, uh, we'll see you guys hopefully uh, a, a week from tomorrow. So Friday, October 9th. And uh, Nadine, thank you for joining us and for thank the presentation. You. Bieber, thank you for joining us today. And oh, thank Laura, everyone. thanks for being amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone, for yeah. being here. I appreciate it. And now, yes, and thank you, everyone, for joining us and those great questions. And um, check out the new diet. <laughs> all right. Take it easy, everyone. Um, all the best to you and your flock. And until uh, next time, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. bye.